Good morning, and welcome to the 2021 Alan M. Boyden Memorial Lectureship. I'm Nick Cockler, the Andy and Bev Hansel Endowed Chair in Applied Healthcare Ethics at the Providence Center for Healthcare Ethics. We are broadcasting live from Providence St. Vincent Medical Center on Teams Live, which has brought us an expanded viewership in this virtual world. Currently, Grand Rounds is only available to watch virtually. You can earn CME credit for watching either live or a recording of this event which will be available via the same link as the invite for today's talk. We will be monitoring the Q&A throughout the session, so please do submit your questions and we'll hold them to the end as time permits. For those who don't know Dr. Boyden, he was a well-respected and world-renowned leader in local and national arenas, who was a surgeon at Providence St. Vincent Medical Center for over 48 years. One of his greatest attributes as a physician and a surgeon was his ability to find wholeness in the doctor-patient relationship. This lectureship promotes excellence in patient care by connecting medicine with the humanities. It is made possible by the generous contributions of our supporters through the Providence St. Vincent Medical Foundation. And I understand we are uh, joined today virtually by uh, two of Dr. Boyden's sons, Alan and Bradley. Welcome. It is now my privilege to introduce our 2021 speaker, Dr. Molly Osborne. Dr. Osborne is Professor Emeritus of Medicine in the Pulmonary and Critical Care Division of Oregon Health and Science University and Integrated Ethics Program Officer at the Portland VA Healthcare System. She served as Associate Dean of Student Affairs for 18 years and remains in leadership positions at both the VA and with the American Thoracic Society. Dr. Osborne has published 63 articles and 89 abstracts. For the last 20 years, her scholarship has been focused on ethics and end-of-life care co-authoring a policy statement from the American Society, American Thoracic Society on requests for potentially inappropriate treatment in ICUs. More recently, she has collaborated on creating graphic narrative vignettes, teaching tools for medical bioethics with two publications in the Annals of Internal Medicine. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Osborne. So thank you, Nick. And thank you for those kind words. And the best part of this morning is I get to take off my mask for a brief period of time. So I'm Molly Osborne, and yes, I do head ethics at the VA, and I have been very interested in the humanities for a number of years. Um, I'd like to thank both Dr. Boyden and Alan and Bradley for having a lectureship like this. I think it's particularly important to look at medical humanities, and I'll try to tell you why as I go through my talk over the next hour or so. I'd also like to just take a, a few moments and just think about the land I'm standing on of indigenous peoples and say thank you again. So I'm gonna talk about my great passion, which is the humanities and tell you a little about my own story. So you can see the title not only says graphic medical education, so I will talk about graphics, I will talk about medicine, and I'll certainly try to think of all of us, everybody who's listening to this as some kind of teacher, whether you're working with your family or trainees, or you're working with nurses in the hospital or your colleagues, we're all teachers. And so I'm gonna use this opportunity to tell you that comics and other kinds of medical humanities can be used to humanize the medical experience. Um, not surprisingly, I have no disclosures at all. Uh, and I have to start out with a cartoon which says change is hard, but not changing is fatal. And you see people in a group, okay, this is pre-COVID, and you see what they say, which is, what if we don't change at all? And something magical happens. And I show you this because there needs to be change. Not only are their profits plummeting and their sales plummeting, as you can see from the graph, but in fact, we all need to change in how we educate people. And what I wanna point out also with the magic is, I actually have one case in my entire history of being a lung doctor in which we used a uh, magic wand and it works. So if people remind me at the end, I'll tell you the story. We'll see how the story, how this goes. So I'm gonna talk about graphic medical education. My point is that we're changing how we teach and learn. And even when I was a Dean for Student Affairs at OHSU, we were using flipped classrooms. That means that the students were actually learning all the material before they showed up. Yes, they were, can actually be quizzed so that when they come, they know the information and the opportunity for discussion happens. Today, what I'm going to emphasize is integrating medical humanities within medical education, as I've mentioned, but I'm also hoping to make it interactive. So interactive sections turn out to be enormously important, and I'm hoping, if you wish, this is by invitation, that you will put things in your Q&A or chat box as we go through this so that there's actually an interaction between me and all of you out there, or maybe one or two of you out there, or maybe none. It's by invitation, but it gives the opportunity to interact. 
my learning objectives are fairly straightforward. First, I'll define medical humanities. Um, there may be more than one definition. I'll simply show you one. I won't give you an example of every single one that would take more than my time, but I will show you an example through a classic doctor patient picture from the 19th century in art. I'll also give you an example in poetry. Uh, certainly through COVID, there's been a lot written and I'll show you a poem by Kim Stafford, who's our Oregon Poet Laureate. And then I'll talk about, of course, my passion, which is graphic narratives and show you two comics, which are really meant to be used as not only fun, but uh, teaching tools for the medical humanities. And finally, I'll show you how you can yourself be a poet and I'll show you how Elizabeth Latte at OHSU has popularized this and give you some examples. Then to understand the purpose of medical humanities, I think you already know. I don't think this is a surprise to any of you. We're trying to promote empathy for our colleagues and our patients, particularly in this time of COVID. And to provide teaching tools is not only important for our trainees, but as I already mentioned, it's important for all of us because in some ways we teach everybody we come in contact with. And finally, I invite you to give your input in the Q&A or chat box probably three or four times over the next period of time. So let me start with the definition of medical humanities. I will read it off, but what I want to tell you is I actually had the opportunity to be a professor at Penn State, a visiting professor a few years ago. This is the introduction to actually have the opportunity to um, develop a comic. And all of these ways of teaching medical humanities were true at Penn State. And what I mean by that is they actually had a medical humanities department as part of their College of Medicine. So the trainees were all exposed to the medical humanities. Certainly they were exposed to literature, they were exposed to art, they were exposed to creative writing, and I'll take a little liberty here to say comics because we also um, did develop comics there and the head of the department at that time was Michael Green, is very well known if anybody's particularly interested in graphic narrative. They had drama, they had film, they had philosophy, ethical decision making, of course, I couldn't be invited here, I think without at least giving a nod to Kevin Dirksen and Nick Kuckler for the great um, department they have here of ethics and, and, a, and a small shout out to Eileen Moody and Kelsey Chelsworth for all the work that they've done to make this all possible. But let me continue. Uh, anthropology, history and music were also part of the Penn State Medical Humanities and in particular they had a whole emphasis on jazz which I just thought was fabulous. And again the purpose of medical humanities is to provide insight into the human conditions. So this is not only for our patients for whom we see the illness and suffering and try to be a part of what they're experiencing and offer empathy. It's also how we see ourselves and how we see others. If we really understand ourselves, as you know, we are much more empathic with others. And so the medical humanities can bring this home. And I'll, I'll have a little shout out to Dr. Uh, Boyden a little later on because I actually used the comics with surgeons and I'll tell you that story in a bit. And then of course, how we define our roles as professionals can be easily taught um, through comics. There are many ways to teach it, but all of these are important in educating our future providers. So what was my wake up call? I'd written my 63 papers. OK, maybe only 60 by that time. And I was an ICU physician uh, at the VA. I'd been at the university, but I'd moved to the VA for my ICU work, although I was still associate dean for student affairs. And just think of a hectic day, whatever your hectic day is like for maybe Alan and Bradley, it wouldn't be in the intensive care unit, but for me it was. And I was rushing around one patient whose life I thought would go well, I was trying to save. One patient who was doing very poorly, I thought would not last very long. So I was racing through these rounds and I turned around and my intern was in tears. And I stopped. And I'll tell you a little more about my intern in a minute, but I wanna fast forward to the bottom of the slide to tell you that Karen Adams, who was that intern, is now professor and vice chair of education at OBGYN and OHSU, and we're still teaching together with respect to the medical humanities using something called the balance system. If anyone's interested, I can tell you about that at the end. There are many ways to teach the humanities is my point. But back to my intern in tears. So I stopped. I did take her aside. I did find out what the issues were, and I did learn that it, there were ways I could be much more humanistic in the intensive care unit. At the same time, the medical students wanted a healer's art elective. They'd heard of Rachel Remen, which many of you uh, may be familiar with. She's written extensively as a physician on the humanities. And the sessions we did for OHSU were four sessions, the loss of identity. You not only become a professional, but think for a minute if you want, the, at the very beginning when you're in your 20s and you're becoming a professional, you're becoming yourself, you lose, you give up what you were when you were in college or when you were younger in high school, and there's a real loss of identity. So 
the four parts of the healer's art elective include loss of identity, the grief we've all felt in taking care of our patients, the awe in medicine, and the commitment we make when we take the Hippocratic Oath. But let me stop with the awe in medicine, which for me was the most fun. Uh, this is the story Karen Adams would tell. She would say that there can be real awe in medicine, because if you think about it, and you're in a room and somebody's giving birth, let's say there are four people in the room, suddenly there are five. And that awe, when you suddenly realize that a new life has come into that room, come into being, is miraculous. So as I mentioned, my wake up call was through a day of hectic rounds in the ICU. I went on to give a series of sessions with Rachel Remen's Healer's Art for many years when I was an associate dean, and that humanism is hopefully still there today. So let me move forward to the various examples of medical humanities that we can see. And I'm gonna start with the 19th century, and I'm gonna start with a classic picture. This was um, painted in 1891. Luke Fildes was the artist, and what you're meant to see here is there's a physician in the room leaning forward. Um, you can decide in your own mind if the person's empathic or feeling insecure that that person can't make more of a difference. There's a young um, child in the bed. It's actually a boy, as I'll come back to in a minute. And there's a father standing in the background, not well seen the way the lighting is in the, pa in the um, particular picture that you see here. So now I'm gonna try an interactive session. I'm gonna invite your input. And uh, as I said, this is invitational. If you don't put anything in the Q&A, we will uh, move forward and I'll give you some other information. But if you wish, think about what feelings you experience seeing the doctor and put a phrase or two in the Q&A chat. And I'm gonna wait for 15 seconds, but you can go ahead and submit now. So when I say submit, I'm saying submit, go ahead and put your answers in the Q&A chat. And I'll just hold my breath for 15 seconds while you look at this picture and think about um, what you might have experienced if you were in that setting. Let me tell you what the doctor observed and what was very common in that environment. The Victorian doctor observed the critical stages in a child's illness. The parents gazed from the periphery. The parent was not involved, very different than the 21st century. Was this portraying the values of the ideal physician? Was this portraying the inadequacy of our profession? People actually think this was based on Fildes' own experience because it was around the death of his son. And I will just mention that there are a few comments coming through now which are what you might, uh, which I very much welcome and I appreciate, such as a feeling of paralysis. We have that today, even with all the technology available. The concern and the caring that is felt, and I might add, it was probably felt just as much, if not more, by the father in the background who ended up painting this picture. Thank you. So that was one example of art, and there will be other kinds of comments coming through the chat box, and I will give them uh, I'll give them to you as they occur. But if I don't mention the one you particularly wanted to tell me, bring it up in the end, because I'll make sure there's time for Q&A. So let me move forward to poetry in the 21st century. And we'll do the same kind of thing where I'll show you a poem and ask you for your feelings about this poem. So we all know that COVID-19 has changed us irrevocably. It was called initially SARS-CoV-2 because it's very much like the SARS virus. At noon, I'll talk more about the epidemiology from AIDS to COVID. 19. However, for the rest of this talk, I'll just call it COVID-19. And I'm going to talk about poetry and the kind of COVID. And this is really about thanking healthcare workers. And if you can remember to last spring, my daughter was in New York, she's still in New York and remembers this vividly. There was a huge outpouring of thanks. And I just want to take a moment here in this talk to thank every single one listening on the phone who's on MS Teams, who's otherwise connected with this talk, because everything you've done can only be helpful in trying to bring community together in this extraordinary time. And what I show you on the left is the picture that says before. And of course, before was when we were all in a conference room, no masks are on, and uh, we're taking care of our patients. Maybe we're having a meeting. Uh, but then on the right with the arrow, I'm showing a poem by Kim Stafford. And he wrote this last March. So if you can remember to last March, this is what he wrote. Uh, this is published in the Oregonian. And he, of course, is a, uh, an Oregon Poet Laureate and was from 2018 to 2020. Long before the pandemic, the trees knew how to guard one place with roots and shade. Moss found how to hug a stone for life. Every stream 
works out how to move in place, staying home even as it flows generously. Outward, sending bounty far. Now is our time to practice singing from balconies, sending words of comfort by any courier, kindling our lonesome generosity to shine in all directions like stars. And I can tell you, my daughter in New York said you could hear the banging at 5 p.m. throughout the city um, as people were thanking our, their healthcare workers. And as I said, this is a thank you to all of you. And I'll ask you again for your input, just as you gave input before and thank you. Um, I invite you to put down what feelings you're experiencing now. Fast forward to now to February 23rd, Tuesday, looking back on the last year with COVID-19. Go ahead and put a word or phrase in the Q&A box. Um, go ahead and submit. The do not submit yet, I, I, I should probably take that off. Just go ahead and submit your answers and uh, I'll wait for about 15 seconds and see what comes up. So go right ahead and submit. And again, it's invitational and thank you. Intense longing. So I'm just going to repeat what Nick is telling me. Intense longing. And I can tell you, I feel the same. I'm not going to cry. This is a talk. This is a formal talk, but I feel that intense longing. Isolation. Isolation. As you notice, what was my high point of this talk besides the talk itself and reaching out to all of you? Taking off my mask. Grateful. Grateful. We have vaccines. Many of the people I've ex uh, met just this morning coming over to Providence Hospital to give a talk have now been vaccinated. We're still masking. We're still safe distancing, but we've had a vaccine. Grateful indeed. Guilt and fatigue, impatience, concern, love. Guilt and fatigue, impatience, concern, and love. All of these, guilt, fatigue, concern, uh, not only patients in terms of our patients, but the own patient, the patients we have to have in this time, and love. These are critical right now. Um, it's not over, and it's not going to go back to where it was pre-COVID-19 in the very near future. So thank you for sharing those feelings. And as more come up, we'll record them. And when we get to Q&A, we can share them again. But thank you. So I gave you an example of art in the medical humanities and, of course, a poem that was about COVID-19. And now, of course, I'm going to turn to graphic narratives in the 21st century. And the story here is that I had written my papers in palliative care and ethics. And I'm not saying I didn't love doing that, but the idea of doing a comic, of telling my own story in the intensive care unit, was rather pleasing. So the, I will show you only parts of the comic. It's published in the annals. It was published in 2018. But graphic narratives have become not only a thing for me, but if you go to Powell's or pre-COVID went to Powell's, there would be um, several different aisles filled with narratives or comics because this is the way that many young people are now reading and teaching um, through this method. And I would argue that we could actually teach with this and I'll show you an example. And my example is called critical space. It shows the challenges of illness. It shows futility and the moral distress it creates. Again, I'll just show a few of the panels of the whole comic. And again, I'm going to ask for input. And thank you, all of you who are listening in or watching for giving your input. So this was called critical space. It's my own story. It's all true. Um, it was published by Kimberly Myers, who of course was at Penn State, and another wonderful colleague of mine, Charlotte Wu, who's now in London. Um, it's a graphic narrative, and you can see in the picture there, grief. Grief is in the long shaded cloak, and you can see that there's um, what's uh, death, and you see the cemetery with people surrounding the um, coffin. And here's the boy who was in that coffin. This is Colin. And Col now fast, this is a flashback back to when I was intensive care unit doctor, you can see the ICU doctor <laughs> labeling who I am, but Colin was being transferred to the ICU and I was just joining the faculty at OHSU. And so I said, of course, tell me about a transfer as the oncologist tried to transfer a patient to the ICU. And he said, this is a 32 year old man with leukemia in respiratory distress, end stage leukemia, I might add, with um, no hope of cover recovery. This was actually for palliative chemotherapy and he had developed respiratory distress. Well, I happen to know, and I still remember the article, I knew intubation wouldn't help. If someone has severe sepsis, underlying leukemia and ARDS, there's very little hope of recovery in this situation. And um, I had the data to show it. But, and you can see I'm already feeling the grief, but what does the oncologist do? He puts on his armor. Now this is metaphorical, of course, 
but it works in a comic. And he comes back and he says, we've already decided the family expects the transfer to the ICU. So once the family's expecting a transfer, a subspecialist wants the transfer or a primary care physician, I'm gonna be taking the patient into the ICU. I'm gonna accept the patient. But I'm thinking this is a disaster. So what do I do? I put on my armor. Why? Because I have to go to the intensive care unit and get my team to take care of Colin. So you can see that there are a cluster of people working to put a breathing tube in him, to give him a breathing machine. So I say intubate, get him on the vent. And they're um, scurrying around for some period of time and then there's nobody. I'm not saying there aren't people outside the room. I'm not saying there aren't um, windows so that people can very carefully observe Colin, but there he is alone. And when I showed this picture to people who were not in medicine, I thought, oh, this is gonna be too hard for them. And one of my friends immediately brought a picture of her son and it looked just like this. So our technology has outstripped our humanity in some cases. He passed away and then I had to talk to the family. And I still remember exactly where I was sitting when I had, and you can see me sitting there with my armor Grief is with me and I'm saying surgery won't help. Actually, nothing was gonna help. He developed an uncle herniation for those of you in the know. It's the only one I've ever seen where he actually lost brainstem function and was no longer essentially alive. And I had to tell the mother that he was essentially dead. But she was a healthcare provider. She'd worked in an ICU. She wanted an EEG, an MRI, a CAT scan. And in fact, as the comic unfolds, she gets angrier and angrier. And what did I do? So I'm pausing because that's what I did. I didn't know what to say. I paused for two hours while she talked. And in the end, she didn't need an MRI or an EEG or a CT because she wasn't gonna be able to bring back her son. And so you see here the grief that we both share, different grief perhaps for a provider than a patient, maybe the same, maybe different, with, uh, but you can see my armor is gone. And I invite your input and I'll do it in two ways. I'll have two questions. One is, what do you think the armor represents? And again, submit away. Don't wait, don't wait. Just go ahead and put your answers in the Q&A chat box and we can look at responses if they, as they come up. And I'll probably just mention one or two if they do come up and uh, then I'll move forward to the second one. And I'll tell you my favorite response was from a chaplain who said, oh, this must be like um, one of those gladiators where you go in and you save lives. And I'm thinking that was not my thought about the armor at all. And another person said, well, there's a little opening in the armor, which you can see here. And that might, she said, oh, your heart's coming out. And I thought, I didn't even see that. Defense power. So there's an enormous hierarchy in the medical profession and the comments of defense and power represent that in the armor. And that's very much what I was actually thinking. Thank you. And what feelings do you experience seeing the patient in the intensive care unit alone, surrounded by life support machines and technology? Again, go ahead and put something in the Q&A and chat box right away. You don't need to wait. Um, and thank you. Ego, less human, I, that might have been before the so there are a lot of different feelings, um, whether this was for the armor or now, we're not quite sure, but certainly there is an, uh, certainly there's terrible loneliness and there's a feeling of isolation. And of course, there's no family in the room. But the other thing I wanna leave you with is when in doubt, always listen first. This not only works well with the particular comic that I showed you, it works really well with children, I'm just saying. So I gave this talk on critical space to surgeons, and this is where I wanna really thank Dr. Boyden for inviting me to give this talk, because I went to give it to a group of surgeons. They were having um, their usual ethics talk. And when I walked in the room, not that all surgeons don't love ethics, um, but they looked uh, very tired and like this was gonna be an hour that was maybe not as useful as they'd hoped. So I shared that comic. And the next thing you knew, every single one of them had a story their own story about their own patients. The neurosurgeon said, oh yeah, we see uncle herniation all the time. I've seen one in my life. Um, and for Alan and Bradley, if you're listening in, which I hope you are as teachers and artists, um, this is a very good mechanism to evoke feelings using the comics, using the graphic narratives. 
The other thing that happened in parallel is we began at the VA called uh, what we called unit-based ethics conversations. I want to credit Dr. Lucia Woschel because we actually now can have providers meet only with providers, not with patients. And often the providers don't even want to meet with people outside their hierarchy. In other words, they don't want the attending, they want just the team or just the nurses or just the chaplains to really talk about the various feelings they're experiencing. So I think that comic could be used in many different ways. Now, can we combine it with data? And the answer, of course, is gonna be yes. And so I'm gonna use the example of using interpreters for one more comic and point out we frequently need interpreters for diverse patients. In fact, this is becoming more and more essential as we deal with the diverse population in our country and, and globally. Many of people who come to the US have not yet learned English. So I'll present uh, just a few select panels from a comic demonstrating the importance of an interpreter. Now, it's a little bit of a happy ending. It's a little bit maybe too cute, uh, but it's a great comic. I love it. It's, a, again, a true story from Charlotte Wu, my colleague in London. And then also data demonstrating the challenges using an interpreter. So I'm using multiple modalities to educate and communicate complex information. And you see here the title, which is broken speech, but you also see the vase is broken. And for the artists in the group who know about this, I did not. It's called Kintsuki, and it's a Japanese lacquer method with dusted gold to fix to fix something that's broken. And if you go on any kind of Google or your own search engine and look for Kintsuki, you'll see beautiful lacquerware with this um, often gold but occasionally silver repairing a broken vase. But on to the comic. So here's an elderly gentleman. He's broken his vase and the daughter is concerned because he's been uh, doing calligraphy on the vase. And the daughter remembers that he's got weight loss, he's fatigued, he's got a tremor. She brings him to this hospital and just briefly it turns out he has metastatic thyroid cancer. It's spread and so there's not going to be a curative treatment. And not uncommonly, what really happens is that the family tries to take care of the family's parent, particularly if that parent doesn't speak English. So the doctor says, I'm afraid it's incurable. But what does the daughter tell the parent? You're sick, dad. The doctor says we could try palliative radiation. What does the daughter say? You need some medicine. The doctor says, but we aren't sure how effective it would be. And the son says, the treatment will make you feel better, dad. And the, of course, he's wondering what's really being said. They go back and forth. When can we start therapy? What trials are out there? What are the side effects? Will insurance cover this? How many times a week do we need to bring him in? How long does he have? And the physician says, this is important. I'm calling a translator. And just to skip ahead in the comic, what happens is after the translator, it turns out he wishes only to return to his hometown to see his childhood friends and family. They get physical therapy for him. He does return home. He comes back two weeks later and of course, it was a wonderful experience, as you see there. And um, in the true story, actually, a vase is given to Charlotte Wu, but it's broken. And she says it's even more beautiful with its imperfections. And perhaps he's thinking like the brokenness in all of us. So communication challenges. An interpreter is often enough, uh, not enough. And I've shown you the comic with a positive ending. But let me show you some medical literature about interpreters. And this is from Seattle, from Randy Curtis's group, who's looked for over two decades on palliative care, on communication challenges. And the background is that more, there are more than 20 million in the US with limited English. I said 19 million in 2008. I'm thinking it's over that now. The aim was to characterize alterations in interpretation during ICU end of life care discussions, EOLC is end of life care discussions. And they looked at 10 family conferences, they videoed 70 family members with Spanish, Russian, Vietnamese, Hmong, Cambodian, Mandarin, Chinese, Somali, and Korean languages. They had validated categories of interpretive alterations, and they had additions, omissions, substitutions, and editorializations that were included. I'll give you two examples, and basically the answer is, this is a real problem. So an example, the doctor says, I don't know, this is a very rapidly progressing cancer. And the translation to the family is, he doesn't know because it starts gradually. I mean, completely uh, missing the point. Another example, family. We want to know if after his lungs recover, will his brain suffer so he won't recognize us? Translation, she wants to know about his lungs. Answer from the MD, we aren't sure, but we think his lungs will improve. So obviously those are two highly selected examples, but the point is in all the alterations, some 322, 75 were significant. They could have either interfered with or enhanced conference goals. They could have transferred information. 
They could have learned about patient preferences, given emotional support, build rapport. But in fact, 93% of that, 75%, in other words, the majority of alterations were significant and they were negative. They were interferences with transfer of information. They reduced emotional support and reduced rapport, which is why I picked two that were particularly concerning to make the point that in fact, when you talk with an interpreter, please make sure that the interpreter says back as best the interpreter can what the patient has actually said. And if possible, and I have a very hard time with this often trying to get an interpreter, try to use an interpreter and not a family member. So I've tried to use that example to show that comics can be used, but they can be coupled with other modalities. And one question was, what if you can't draw? And so I'm gonna come in a moment to using poetry at the bedside, the synquane, to give you an opportunity to do something if you can't draw. By the way, anybody actually can draw. I've actually done workshops with people who felt they couldn't draw, and you certainly can draw a line. You can draw two lines. The drawing doesn't have to be perfect. You should have seen my first drawing for critical space. I had all the panels. <laughs> I can tell you something. We hired somebody. So yes, you can do it if you can't draw, but if you're going to publish, talk to me about getting someone to help you out. Um, so let me do, and this is the last part of my talk, an example where you can all become humanists who are creative and do a poem. And I'm going to tell you a poem called The Synquane. And I've gotten the idea from Elizabeth Latte. She's a physician at OHSU. She teaches narrative medicine and reflective practice. And her focus is developing identity formation and resilience via story. She co-founded the Northwest Narrative Medicine Consortium and this is throughout this um, region. I actually have given a talk there as well. And this is a group that is all comers. You don't have to be a provider. You don't have to be a physician. And its focus is to explore the experience of illness through any kind of story at all. And she teaches how to write a synquane. So let me tell you about a synquane. A synquane is a five line poem. So what are the five lines? There are, the first line has two syllables. The second line has four syllables. The third line has six syllables. The fourth line has eight syllables and the last one has two. So I'm sure you all have figured it out. I did not. So I needed to see an example and I made up one that I'm going to share with you. And I am going to go back to the discussion I was telling you earlier with Karen Adams when we did healers art, when we use Rachel Remen's experiences to actually teach sessions of humanism to our medical students. And her awe in medicine example, of course, was a birth. And so in the synquane, here's how we could describe it. And anybody could write this. A patient could write this. The two syllables, a life. The four syllables, a new small life. Six syllables, only small in her size. Eight syllables, her energy fills the space of, two syllables, our hearts. So a life a new small life, only small in her size. Her energy fills the space of our hearts. Um, it's not that hard to write one like that. So I'm gonna give you all the opportunity, because we have a few minutes, to try writing one. And if any of you is actually willing to put one in the chat box, I would be delighted. So if you wanna start working on that while I show you one more example, go for it. Here's one more five line poem um, that I actually wrote last night because I thought, well, you should have more than one. And I, something that was on my mind was taking care of a disabled patient at the VA. And it goes, disabled. The grief I feel, now she will never fly. But as I think about it, nor will I. And of course the point here is she's not actually gonna fly, but she's never gonna regain what I see as normal behavior, so she's disabled, although now we would say has special needs or there would be other better language, so please bear with me if um, that language is not quite perfect. But the point is all of us, whether um, dis uh, having problems with a special need or having problems because of the brokenness inside us, all of us in our own ways have some kind of brokenness that we are working on. And so I thought this was a very, easy way to talk about this. Now, Elizabeth had did a whole grand rounds on this and what she did was she actually stopped and I'm gonna try this now, we'll see how this goes. I'm gonna give us not just, you know, 10 seconds, but I'm gonna give us perhaps as long as a minute and see if anyone is willing to try and write a synquane. And if so, we'll, uh, and if you're willing to, sh you have to both write it and if you're willing to share it, 
and put it in the Q&A. We will share it with the group um, and we would be delighted to do so because I think it's a very powerful method. And as you're thinking and as you're writing, I'll just tell you another story. She actually uses it with her patients. It turns out patients, of course, are going through the same experiences that we are. They may see it differently, as I've shown you in the cartoon about critical space where the woman has grief beside her, me as the provider has grief beside me. Are they the same grief? Maybe, but maybe not. And what's important is the patient, him or herself, can also write a synquain. So Elizabeth Latte, with her patients, actually, oh, just one second. Oh, thank you. Is that what you needed? Um, actually, I didn't give Nick Cuckler enough credit. He's there trying to write things down madly as I'm talking. So I thought I'd give him a pen. It might help, you know, for although he perhaps could have drawn it on the blackboard. I don't know. Um, but back to Elizabeth Latte and the patients. So the point is she would actually have her patients write synquains. And she said it was really powerful because oftentimes, as you all know, who are providers, if you go to see a patient, the patient doesn't immediately respond with his or her true feelings. Uh, and in fact, may not tell you at all. But through a poem, that person may be able to convey the feelings that that person is experiencing. So she's found that very powerful with her patients. She also does it with her trainees. And it's also a very good way of making a connection across trainees, because as you may know, when you're working with a group of people for a short period of time, it might be a month, it might be six weeks, it might be a week, trying to make an emotional connection, trying to bring out that sense of human humanitarian feeling is really a challenge. So comics help if you can draw or not draw. Synquains can be very helpful. And I actually had another wonderful patient who had a liver transplant and he was an artist. And he drew pictures and put them up all over the room so that when people came in, they could see his experience of getting a catheter placed, of having a procedure done, of his feelings of loneliness and isolation. So there are many ways that the humanities can be very useful in our own education and teaching. And I'm just trying to remind you that this is not just for trainees, but it's also for our patients. And it makes an enormous difference for them as well. So oh, I'm just going to summarize the learning objectives and then we'll see if we have a synchroin to share. So first of all, I've defined the medical humanities and I've tried to make it clear that the medical humanities can be incorporated in all aspects of our lives, but certainly in medicine, um, it's extremely important to use them. We can learn with examples of medical humanities such as art, poetry, graphic narratives, and of course I had fun with the synchroin. And I'm going to stop for a minute and ask if Nick actually has one. I think there's a couple here. So I think I'm going to be quiet and see if he can say them uh, slowly, loudly, and clearly so you can all hear them. COVID, alone at home, missing hugs, missing touch, wearing clothes that look unreal, please end. And I'm going to have you read it twice. One thing I've learned with poetry, um, not that I wasn't happy telling you my point, but actually when someone else creates something, it takes a moment to assimilate it. So I'm going to have him read each poem twice. So he's going to read it one more time. Thank you, Nick. COVID, alone at home, missing hugs, missing touch, wearing clothes that look unreal, please end. Thank you. A stack, paper to sign, signatures of value, to no one but the fax machine, who sighs. How many people have experienced that in one way or another? I'll have him read it one more time, but <laughs> that makes me laugh. Thank you, Nick. A stack, paper to sign, signatures of value, to no one but the fax machine, who sighs. And I must say, I sigh just hearing about it because I work at the VA as you have already heard. And as you can imagine at the VA, there is no shortage of fax forms, papers to sign, forms to be created and then filled out. And one does wonder about the true meaning of it. Is there any more or is that it? There's two more, at least two more. Okay. Lonely, despite her friends, a loss of connection, permeates this pandemic life. Where's love? Notice how the theme of love has really been an undercurrent of this entire talk. If I was to take one word for the medical humanities, it would be sharing love. 
in our own man ways that are manifest in our own artistic creativity. I'm going to have Nick read that one more. It's lovely. Lonely, despite her friends, a loss of connection permeates this pandemic life. Where is love? And where is the love? Today. Today is now. Now is soon gone goodbye. Moving on, moving on, it goes, now gone. And for all of you, as you hear these poems, you may have many different responses. When I hear that, I get shivers because I remember we each have today. And in terms of the medical humanities, we only have today. And to really think through what you're going to do today, I can tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to have coffee when this is done, and who knows what you all will do. But I'll have Nick read it once more. Today. Today is now. Now is soon gone. Goodbye. Moving on. Moving on. It goes. Now gone. Fabulous. So in conclusion then, I think that you have a sense of the medical humanities and their purpose. I mean, listen to what people have just written in the last hour, whether it's feelings such as paralysis, concern, caring, tired, detached, the confounding of what we're dealing with, the confusion, the sadness, the helpful, the helplessness and the hopefulness. Um, what I want you to understand is those are all words you have put into the Q&A in the chat box. We have, we clearly, clearly this group has the medical humanities. And uh, hopefully in this time, there's been some attempt to promote empathy for our colleagues, our patients, and for each one of you who's um, listening to this. And I will not soon forget the young boy who came comatose to my ICU. And in terms of providing teaching tools for our trainees, I will not soon forget the patient who became disabled. And I'm gonna end with one more sing point, I believe, from Dr. Latte, is that right? Mm -hmm. And she's the uh, physician I mentioned earlier who actually taught me about sing point, so please. Wonder and grief alike. You will arrive today, but not in the way I wanted. Welcome. Well, I'm glad she can welcome it. I might have to learn from Dr. Latte. I'll have Nick read it one more time. Thank you. Wonder and grief alike. You will arrive today, but not in the way I wanted. Welcome. That's a wonderful way to actually finish this talk and to make the point that in the end, what we can do is welcome these experiences that are going to continue to come forward. I'll be talking at noon actually about COVID-19 in the future there, which is what's in my mind. Um, but we can still promote empathy for our colleagues and our patients. We can still provide teaching tools for our trainees. And I'll just end by saying, as other people have already said, we can welcome it with some kind of feeling of love. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Osborne. Um, I mask will, on. <laughs> Osborne, did I miss you? I'm sorry. No, I took my mask on. Um, so I will continue to monitor the Q&A, and uh, if others have questions, please feel free to uh, chime in, and we will have a discussion. Maybe to um, get some of the Q&A started, if you could uh, speak more about um, the process of actually composing a comic and, and how did you go from idea to publication? Um, what I'll do if you want is have, a, have you have a seat. See, if Nick sits down, then my mask comes off. So this is, this is, all, about, <laughs> this is all about getting to actually be me. Um, so how did actually the comic get written? Well, this is a favorite story. So if other comic, if other questions come up, I think I can probably pivot and answer a question or two. But um, the comic happened in an extraordinary way. I've been working on this palliative care. And as Nick mentioned, there was a 2015 uh, group that met and ultimately published something called potentially ineffective therapy. And the point is at end of life, we really can't predict who's going to live or die. And we don't really know what's going to help. But oftentimes, we're asked by our colleagues or our therapists or our patients to do something we really think is not going to help, like the 
critical space and it's a disaster to bring the person to the ICU. So I already was thinking about that kind of thing. And I have this girlfriend who, of course, is Kimberly Myers and is the first author who told me that I could write a comic. And I was like, really? So she then, she then had Charlotte and I come to Penn State as visiting professors. And it was wonderful because we met with Michael Green, who's uh, at that time headed the department, quite famous for graphic narrative. And he said, of course, what's your background? What do you want to do? And I said, I want to write a graphic novel. And he said, well, how much experience do you have? And I said, zero. And I realized in retrospect, as I look back, that's how I do most of my life. If anyone wants to get to know me personally, I often am one of those people who sort of jumps first and asks questions later and don't ask me how I became an ICU doc and an internal medicine doc, but anyway, that's how it is. So she suggested a comic. I got a visiting professorship at Penn State. I knew what I wanted to do and I knew the story. I already knew about Colin. And so I was writing a little, uh, my own interpretation of comics, which certainly was, um, a lot of fun, but it became quickly clear that we needed to actually hire someone to do the cartooning. So Charlotte and Kimberly helped me turn the story into something that could be a graphic narrative. Charlotte helped me realize um, the d ways the pictures could actually be designed. So we knew what to tell the person who did the um, comics themselves, designed them. And then Kimberly is an, a teacher of English. I mean, she's a PhD literature expert. So she helped me turn the language that I started out with into something that could actually be in a comic. So it was very much a group effort. It took years. Um, people always say at the end, oh, you know, it was such a struggle. Well, it was a struggle. We had Skype calls between London, Pennsylvania, and Oregon for, and uh, actually uh, Zoe Shine, who does the comics, is in Massachusetts. So we had these long Skype calls, and now we're trying to get our book published, and I'm not going to go into that headache. Um, but that's how it happened, is it was an idea that had the village around it to support the idea come to fruition. And, and so if, how would I give people advice about this? Whenever you have a creative idea, um, I used to tell this to my students when I was a dean, keep your creative idea. The struggle is not to come up with a creative idea. Lots of people have creative ideas. The struggle is to find people to help you implement them. And there are usually people around who are very willing to help. Um, one other question that came up is about the balance system. Let me spell that for you. It's B A L. I-N-T. Balance is a person, a European, and the system is to have people talk about their experiences. It's aimed at physicians and it uh, is something that came to this country quite a few years ago. I am not a balance facilitator. I don't pretend to be, but I worked with someone who was uh, in Karen, uh, uh, through Karen Adams and OBGYN. We, uh, my co-facilitator, Jill Rahm, a social worker, she and I would meet with OBGYN residents to talk about their experiences. Confidential, of course, these would be groups of six to eight people total. Usually they were coming off call and exhausted. And the last thing they wanted to hear was, what you need is a good yoga class. You need to go out running. You need to do this, that, and the other. They were working at maximum speed and burned out. But the Ballant offered them a chance in a required one hour sit down to talk about what their experiences were with the same group over a period of years during their three year residency program. And this balanced method of taking one case and then you think about the role of each person in the case is a very powerful way for people to develop empathy. So the balanced system is a person's name. It's a particular system. There are facilitators in it. I'm not one, but it's a very effective method again to bring out feelings. So if I was doing critical space with the balanced method, I'd have someone play the mother who was angry. I might have someone play the son who was dying, who's clearly part of the story, someone playing the oncologist who wants, or, or any other subspecialist who's looking for a transfer to an ICU, uh, as well as somebody who plays the doctor, and maybe somebody who plays the nurse who's ex uh, experiencing moral distress because she has to do something she really isn't comfortable doing, she doesn't think she should be doing, but the attending has said, intubate, put the person on a vent. So the ballot method is a way of almost a role play around a particular event. And we all, whether we're physicians or providers or non-providers, have experiences that have stayed with us all our lives. And when we role play the different characters in those, we often come across with much greater empathy for the actual experience itself and, and maybe a little forgiveness and love for ourselves. Thanks, that's a great question. Any other questions?
So I, uh, yes, there are, there's uh, at least one one other question. I wanted to mention to the audience that we have published some of the synquains that uh, others have written um, in case anyone wants to uh, check those out. Um, and one question here is where can one find these comics? Well, <laughs> I, I, it depends what you mean by these. So for my comics, two have been published in the annals. I'll send them both to the people who put on the Boyden lectureship so that they can um, disseminate them widely. They're published, they're in the annals, they're easy to find, but I'm happy to make sure I send them specifically to the people who set up the Boyden Lectureship so that everybody can see them. There is going to be a book. Uh, it has eight vignettes, so it ha addresses some other really important topics in ethics. It's medical, graphic medical ethics is the title of the book, and we were hoping Penn State would have it out by now, but I think we're looking at another year. But once it's out, it'll be downloadable, and we have essays after each vignette to actually uh, have that teaching counterpart in the literature, such as an essay on autonomy or an essay on futility or something like that. Great question. Um, but other than that, all you have to do is go into a bookstore these days or go into the library, or if you can't do either, go online. Graphic narratives are everything from historical to medical. In medical, they're mostly in psychiatry. People who are psychiatry um, physicians are often doing comics, as are their patients as a way of communicating. Um, Craig and Usher is a child and adolescent psychiatrist at OHSU, and he worked with the state to develop panels about schizophrenia, three panels. One panel, what the patient's experiencing. A second panel is what the doctors are experiencing, completely different. And a third panel, what the families are experiencing. And this is very, very helpful in this particular case because often the family is overwhelmed when a patient develops schizophrenia at a young age and it helps the parents understand the fog that the patient's in or the other kinds of emotional experiences that are happening and can also see how the providers are trying to deal with this. So there are many, many kinds of uh, graphic narratives that are very popular in the literature and I think uh, we in medicine are actually latecomers to the uh, experience. Thank you. There is a request here to tell the story about the magic wand. Ah, the magic, oh, I was hoping somebody would ask. So this is a different story. We're moving away now from comics. Um, we can keep the humanism and the love, um, but we're moving away to a patient story. So I'm a lung doctor, work at the end, worked first at the university, then at the VA, and I had a patient who came to me very short of breath. And he was so short of breath that his wife was very upset because they couldn't go on walks together the way they had in the past. He probably came to me in April or May of a year some time ago. And I said, well, and uh, at that time, because he came to the lung specialist, he'd already had a number of tests that showed essentially normal findings. His lung function appeared to be normal. His chest x-ray appeared to be normal. When I examined him, he didn't have any wheezing. He didn't seem to have any occult asthma. I'm getting into medicine. Let me just take a breath and say that after we talked, it appeared that there was nothing life-threatening going on, and he wanted some fairly sophisticated test done that would be the next kind of test that would be done, a high-resolution CT, perhaps an echo, and so forth for those in the medical uh, jargon department. In any event, we agreed that since the numbers were normal, and I walked him around and he didn't drop his oxygen or anything like that, that one thing he could do, this will not be a shock, was to exercise. So now you know where this is going. So he did. He did for about three months and he came back. He said, you know, actually, I feel a lot better. Then, I know I should have done this at the beginning, but then I took an extended history. And of course, the other message is always take an extended history. So it turned out he'd had surgery several years ago, had had some low back pain and had some surgery and was told to be really careful about any exercise at all during the healing process. Well, fast forward to the time he see, had seen me, he hadn't been exercising to any amount at all and was really nervous about doing it um, because of the post-op recommendations that had been made. But once he started exercising, of course, he did better and better. And I told him when I first saw him, well, I don't have a magic wand, but yes, you can go try exercising. And I realize it's fairly simple. Come back and see me. So I did, told him that in April. In the summer, he was doing better. We agreed not to do the tests, <coughs> that he'd come back and see me in October. <coughs> And when he came back in October, he brought me a magic wand. So that <coughs> is my magic wand story. <coughs> Sorry about the cough. It's okay. 
Well, to um, thank you for that story. And uh, uh, another question here. Uh, there's actually two more questions, but we may only have time for, for one. How do you present information to the patient's family so they will listen and wait to ask for questions or comments immediately, but you wait until you have finished your presentation? And feel free to pause and take the time you need to gather. <coughs> See the question? Sure. How do you present information to the patient's family so they will listen and wait to ask questions or, com or, or comments immediately, but wait until you have finished your presentation? Well, that is re <coughs> really hard. Really, really hard. So I'm pausing. It's very hard with families. With families, I usually do the opposite. My job is to listen. Their job is to talk. But let me just point out again back to Randy Curtis in Seattle, who's done um, studies looking at what gives the best patient or family satisfaction. It's the time they have to talk in a meeting. It's not the content. It's not how good the doctor was. It's how much time did they have to talk. So I actually take the view that it's important to let them talk. And they actually had one patient who had um, a problem coughing up blood. <clears throat> and um, there were some psychosocial issues, so he was not well liked. And finally, he came to me um, because I agreed that I'd take on this responsibility of a patient who seemed very unhappy with his health care. So he came in and he just talked. Now, he didn't talk for two hours. He probably talked for maybe 10 minutes. And he said, no one has ever listened to me before. And we bonded. And it was really interesting because what patients and families need is the chance to talk. So. I need to pause. They need to talk. Is that getting at the answer? It's really important because I'll tell you one other great story. So I'm a, I love movies, all movies, and I love all actors and actresses. So Gabriel Byrne is someone you may or may not have heard of, an Irish actor, and he was on a hospital TV show called In Treatment. He played a psychiatrist. So he was interviewed and he was asked, well, have you seen a psychiatrist? So you know how to play this part. You're doing very well in this TV show. And he said, no, I haven't seen a psychiatrist. And so the questioner said, well, then how did you learn how to play this role? He said, I'm Irish. I'm doing a show for people in the US. In the US, people are starved to be heard. All I had to do was listen. And so my answer in, from both of these experiences is that the people need to talk. And when they're done talking, first of all, it tells you how to aim your response. Uh, in the ICU at end of life, if I can get a family to talk for 10 minutes, I can find out, do they really want to hear every diagnosis and test I'm going to do, such as in critical space, or do they really want to hear that the team that's working with the patient really loves the patient and how the nurse has been there over and over at the bedside? This is a thank you to all the nurses, by the way. Thank you. And I think one last question um, uh, before we conclude today. How would you characterize or describe the relationship between ethics and the medical humanities, practically, philosophically, or otherwise? And does your work at the VA uh, in the, as an integrated ethics officer include this work on health humanities? So the um, it was a bit of a long question, so I may need a rerun if I miss a piece of it. The short answer is you can put medical humanities in everything. By the time I was working in the ICU, it didn't take long for me to read a 1983 article in chess saying that people from the ICU often move to ethics. And the reason is because we can learn technology. We can learn how to innovate or put someone on an event and so forth. It's a lot of work, but the challenge is to take care of people when there are ethical decisions to be made. So ethics and the humanities, I think, run in parallel. And of course, I mentioned that the medical humanities include ethical decision making. So it is part and parcel. It is the fiber of medical humanities. The other thing is, as heading ethics at the VA, um, as you may know, racial equity is now a very hot button item, and we no longer have an executive order stopping us from teaching racial equity at the VA, so we can now teach it. So we have read books like Cast <clears throat> and How to Be an Anti-Racist, and we've been watching TV shows like 13th and Selma, and I Am Not Your Negro, uh, profiling James Baldwin. But, in, but what my unconscious bias buddy tells me is, what are you going to do about it? So now what I've started doing in my committee meetings in terms of medical humanities is asking at the meeting, because they know me fairly well, I've run the meetings for over 10 years, tell me about your background. 
Tell me where you were born. What kind of culture did you grow up in? And it's one of the best educations in terms of challenges around racial equity I can think about, and we all bond. So the answer is you can bring medical humanities into any place, any workplace you want. I used it in the ICU. I was known as the person that would talk to the families um, and obviously was on a number of these position papers over the last 20 years. Um, but in addition, in, at the VA, I use it very explicitly uh, and as I teach in my preventive and uh, consultation ethics and leadership. Thank you. Thank you again, Dr. Osborne. Uh, really appreciate your wisdom, your uh, artistic prowess, and uh, your, wis your insights as a teacher. And thank you to all of you for joining. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care.